All right, all right, all right. I've learned after doing uh, speaking engagements for about the last five years, I now need to do cultural footnotes to my movie references. So, um, <laughs> all right, all right, all right is Matthew McConaughey from uh, Dazed and Confused. And the really interesting thing about that movie is, is it was really Matthew McConaughey's breakout movie and it's actually pretty bad. Um, it's not a great movie. But um, so uh, I'm gonna test here real quick. Um, it's kind of a 12 step program introduction. My name is Richard and I have an identity problem and your response is, hi Richard. There we go, I know which ones of you have been going to monthly and weekly sessions. So um, we're gonna take a little bit of time on introductions here just so that we can get um, transition time. I've heard the, the five minute transition time has been a little bit challenging uh, for folks to get from one session to the other uh, because we are on the USS uh, Gaylord um, and uh, it is a little difficult to get from one end to the other. But um, I, I'm Richard Bird and I am super excited to give a 25 minute presentation. I know that sounds really, really strange, but. If you've been to Identiverse before, you may know that I've done five consecutive keynotes. And actually, when I submitted my proposal for an abstract this year, I said, please don't make me a keynote. Even I get tired of hearing myself talk. Um, let new people kind of take the stage. And I, I am really excited. There's some really, really fascinating people um, that are giving keynote presentations uh, for the next couple of days. I'm excited to go see them. Um, and I'm excited that it's not me um, because as soon as I'm done with the bow tie, if you know anything about Richard, hashtag the guy with the bow tie. As soon as I'm done with the bow tie, after this session and a quick walk through and Queen's wave at the uh, founders uh, party, um, I'm getting back into shorts and a, and a t-shirt probably. So um, today's uh, session is uh, who the heck is the way that I translate the hat, hash, uh, is that, and it's all the other identities you need to be worrying about. And I wanna, briefly talk about where the title came from. Um, some of you may know, I spent um, three years with Ping Identity as the Chief Customer Information Officer. Um, absolutely adored my executive team. It's really exciting to see them all in person here. Um, loved working for Andre. But um, I was asked to start a podcast. And that podcast was called Hello User. Except before we put in you know, that title, there were a submission for title ideas from around the company. And my idea was, who the heck is that? And I was told it was too edgy for the brand. Um, however, I've spent the last nine months now as a chief product officer for Sexeta. And interestingly enough, there's a connection point um, as it relates to all of their identities, which is nobody knows who the, those identities are. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. What are all these other identities that you need to be concerned about that you don't have any control over today? Um, so I won't introduce myself. I'm a known quantity in the identity industry. I've been around a long time. Um, it's super boring. It's a really war weird life. People shout at me at RSA conferences and then I walk outside and nobody knows who I am. So I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, but I wanna talk about a brief history of identity. And we don't talk about this much. It's one of my favorite stories. For the last six years since I left corporate America, um, I've had the, the opportunity to do nothing but identity all the time. So that means I'm a glutton for punishment. But um, in learning about identity, one of the things that kind of crossed my mind is where did this construct of an account and password come up? Well, like how old is it? And you can pinpoint it actually to 1961, MIT. Um, there was an argument for a long time about was it IBM or was it MIT? Um, and it was actually IBM equipment, but it was MIT students. And interestingly enough, the problem that they had at MIT was the sharing of compute resources for graduate students that were learning how to program on mainframes. Very first mainframe engineers. So what did they do? They created an account and password construct for time sharing on the mainframes. And that time sharing allowed them to have their three hours or whatever the time limit was to be able to do their work and be able to get, get through their graduate studies. And the interesting thing is, is there's a story about one of the MIT graduate students who's now a legend in technology and been around forever. And he said, it took us precisely 11 hours to figure out how to hack the account and password construct so we could sell each other our study time. Now I want you to think about this. 
Since 1961, the entire notion of identity in the compute world was based off a design that was so flawed, it was hacked in 11 hours. And that is where we are today, right? That's why identity still kind of looks like that, right? It's really unfortunate. I was actually talking with some folks at an analyst firm that shall not be named. And I mentioned, I said, talk to six customers in the course of your analyst briefings and ask those six customers which one of them has an active directory on the other side of the DMZ that is still managing external access for some group of people that's not associated with your company. And that analyst firm came back to me and they said, that's weird, we talked to six customers and all six of them said that they had that same structure. That construct is nearly 30 years old. And here we are with identity in a state of a dumpster fire. So when we look at, oh, there we go. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. So what is an identity really? And we don't talk about this much in an identity, which I think is fascinating. Because everybody that's you know, touched by identity, all of our executive sponsors, all of our business partners, everybody, they think that identity is an account and password, right? Which it is not. An account and password is a house key. So when we look at what identity really is in today's digital universe, identity is actually an actor that operates on your behalf. It is the who or the you inside of every digital transaction event or process. And the reason why it's not an account and password is because we can collect and aggregate so much information about the digital version of the analog you these days. We can do GPS, geofencing, we can do speed, we can do impossible travel, we can do... That's why it's no longer accounts and passwords. Accounts and passwords are just a house key. When we think about the actor space of this, though, we go, wait a minute. What do you mean it's an actor? What do you mean an identity is an actor on my behalf? And so we think about that the fact that there are really no human identities in the digital world, which is really weird because I'm sitting in a room with identity practitioners that talk about human accounts and non-human accounts. They're all non-human. They're all a proxy. They are all non-human representations of the human you. When we're talking about workforce identities, customer identities, any identity in the digital space that allows you to transact, there are, if anybody tells you there are human identities, they're missing the point. Because all of these identities are simply proxies that allow the analog you to transact in the matrix. It's just that simple. But when we look at this notion of an actor, like how many digital yous are there? Like Free Guy. Like every time he got hit by a train, it was another him, right? There are studies that show that there are between 165 and 185 digital identities associated with you, particularly in your e-commerce and your government transaction and your, you know, the interactions that you have with companies. There's 165 to 185 of them for every average person on the planet. That's 165 to 185 free guys, right? that are out there that are this digital representation of you. So when we think about this idea of all other identities, we have to kind of tie to some things that have been happening within the cybersecurity interesting, I I industry, which I think are fascinating. You know, I am fortunate, I was asked last year to be um, a uh, identity representative in the Zero Trust Institute. Um, and I, every time I, you know, got an email message about it. I'm like, are you sure you're sending an email to the right guy? Like, because I'm the guy that stood up on stage three years ago or four years ago at Identiverse and said, I don't understand how identity fits within zero trust. And they said, no, 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 you're actually the, the right person for this. And I spent a lot of time with the founder of zero trust. And I think it's really fascinating because I never made the connection points in this world of, of you know, how do you determine whether somebody should have access or something in the framework of trust. Because if you work in identity, this is a tough thing for my zero trust compatriots to hear. If you work in identity and you think about this notion that I just mentioned about the analog and the digital you, we are in the business of determining trust for the human 
transacting the analog into the digital. We have to trust, right? What we've not done a good job over time is, is determining levels of trust, means of trust. We've tried to manage it with policies. We've tried to manage it with rules, right? But we've never really done a great job of determining the why you should be trusted from an identity standpoint. But it's absolutely fundamental to what you do in the identity space because you're taking the person that is coming into the keyboard to enter a session or coming onto the mobile phone to enter a session and then become the digital selves that engage in those transactions. So it raises very interesting questions when we think about your 165 to 185 digital use or the different variations of the digital you in the workforce, right? Or you were a contractor and then you came in as a employee and then you left and then you came back as a contractor, right? In all those cases, there's margin opportunities to not know a lot of information about those identities. In some cases, you don't know any information. Like folks that have a remit for customer access, like how sure are you that that customer on the other end is in the fraudulent account takeover? Yeah, I see a lot of heads nodding, right? You are 100% positive that you are 100% unconfident in the, in the veracity and accuracy of that digital identity. So it raises a question that ties back to my zero trust statement early on. And yes, I, I planned early and I've got my drink. Um, you know, one of the zero trust statements that, um, that John Kinderbag often says in his presentations is how much unknown traffic do you have on your network? Well, if we extend that to we are the interface that allows people into these systems networks, you know, uh, all applications, how many unknown identities do you engage with digitally every single moment of every day? How many 100% completely not sure that is who it's supposed to be do you interact with on a daily basis, on a microsecond basis, right? It's really kind of interesting because when we think about that, we go, oh my gosh, there's like this entire universe of identities that we don't know, that we interact with. So how many identities within your system exist that you don't know the content, or pardon me, the context of why, right? Why do they have access to your system? Well, they signed up and onboarded. Well, so do a bunch of fraudsters and bots. Wait, who are they the proxy for? Who do they represent? Do you have any identities in your system that you don't know the context of and or the proxy for who they represent? I bet you do. I bet you have a lot. The timeliness of when, right? Have, have, do you have a customer account in your system? I've got customer accounts that I go log into a website because I want to go buy something, and I realize that I established that customer account 12 years ago. And I've never used it since. What have companies been doing with that? Like, what have been people been doing with my free guy that's been sitting on the shelf for 12 years since the last time I bought some bird feeder from them, <laughs> right? They don't know, there, there's no timeliness in these unknown identities. And the complete rights of, right? Who, when, what, why? Um, John Kinderbeg loves to describe it as the Kipling method, right? It, it doesn't include the where, but, you know, where's on the GPS geofence. So, um, how many of these types of identities do you have in your system? Tons. Tons. Right? And here's another thing. It's not a rhetorical question. We choose not to know that information about these identities. Matter of fact, it's kind of funny when I walk into companies and I'm like, hey, look, you know, workforce is solved. Workforce is still a problem within your organization because you've decided not to pay the subscription amount necessary to cover all the applications for your workforce in your organization. You've made a conscious choice. People do that for a very good reason. Some things are less risky than others. The problem is, is that we figured out that what you think is less risky is actually not because that's what the bad guys exploit, right? I said this a couple weeks ago at RSA. I have never met a CISO who said, I was hacked exactly the way I thought I was gonna be hacked. I was hacked exactly the way that I structured my pen test. I was hacked exactly the way that I, whatever the case might be, right? We are getting had through more and more innocuous or less risky interfaces. Like who remembers the days? Hands up. Who remembers the day 
uh, that somebody told you that there's no way that I can hack a cloud and go across instances or tenants. Right? Who remembers that? That's been proven violently wrong, right? And so this, this idea of you know, unknowable isn't saying you can't know them. It's saying we've chosen not to know all these other identities, right? And, and sometimes when I talk to companies, they go, whoa, 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 whoa. Workforce was 250,000 identities. And then, uh, you know, my customer space is 7 million identities. This all other identity space, it could be like hundreds of millions. It could be trillions universally. I don't want to even think about it, right? And think about that statement from a cybersecurity standpoint. We are saying all other identities are too big, too hairy, too scary to even begin to plumb the depths of knowing them. Now, reel this back to the idea of zero trust, right? Um, is it possible to have a zero trust framework if you have unknown identities rolling around in your system? Just like it's not possible to have a zero trust framework and have unknown traffic, right, which is what John says. John's always like, hey, do you have unknown traffic on your network? And people go, huh? Yeah. I mean, when I say unknown network on your traffic, everybody that's a network engineer goes, oh. <laughs> When I say, do you have unknown identities in your environment, everyone goes, oh, no. We have no unknown identities. And then I go through that laundry list, and they go, oh, yeah. And we're a little bit arrogant in identity when we think that we have a really good handle on the entire spectrum of identities that we interface with. Partners, um, vendors, contractors. Right, how many of you have, show of hands, how many of you have massive problems with managing access for contractors? There we go. And why is that? Because a contractor, and I'm sorry if you're a contractor, I don't mean to offend you, but you're not a human being. <laughs> you're the human vehicle that delivers what was agreed to in a financial contract Right? And that's why they don't fit into HR systems. That's why they don't, you know, that's why every time I've gone back to certain places, I'm still in the system 25 years later because I was a consultant, you know, two decades ago, and nobody took me out of the system. Right? How is AOID different? How is all other identities different? All these identities that you need to worry about. First of all, when we look at workforce, I've said it before, I'll say it again, workforce is solved. If you are on the customer end of the spectrum, I am sorry to hurt your feelings. But the reality is, is that if you haven't fixed workforce in your organization, it's because you haven't decided to allocate the budget, you don't have the courage and the will to ap actually apply it across your entire environment, and you've just decided that some stuff's less, less risky and I'm not gonna spend that money on it. That does not mean that workforce is not solved. Right? Those mean, that means there are, are intentional choices that you are making about your identity plane but to be honest, workforce is solved, and it's been solved for quite some time, right? There are a host of great solution providers out here today in the exhibition hall that can fix all of your workforce identity problems if you choose to allocate the funds to do so. I get it. It's not as sexy as threat and vulnerability management. I get it. It's not as cool as, you know, perimeter lists and all this other kind of stuff. But you can't walk around and talk about identity being the core of security and then underfund your identity program. Like you just can't, right? So when we look at the workforce, here's what's really, really fascinating about workforce. It's completely linear. You know how these things happen in the course of somebody's career, right? Now, you might terminate somebody for prejudice, right? But, and that might be less, you know, kind of time-bound. But it's still a part of their life cycle, right? You know somebody's going to be gone from your company at least one day. It might be 27 years after they started. It might be two and a half weeks after they started. But it's a natural progression, and it's linear, right? Being linear makes it easier. That's why I say, say it's solved. The other thing that's awesome about workforce is you own the data. <laughs> there are no mysteries. Like, there are no mysteries when it comes to workforce. If you have mysteries, then you have bad data control, right? If you, if you don't understand everything about the people that are associated with direct employment about your company, that's a serious set of problems that has nothing to do with identity, right? That is a data control issue. 
But how is AOID different? We got contractors, we got partners, suppliers, bots, RPA, franchisees. Anybody ever try to do identity for a franchiser? That's freaking weird, right? That is really weird. Like um, nobody actually works for the headquarters, but everybody works for the headquarters. Like, and how do you manage that? No, on top of that, nobody works for the headquarters and there are 3,700 companies that own however many subways or Taco Bells all around the world, but somehow there's an affiliation by brand and marketing. How do you do identity in those, in those cases? That's, that fits into these other identities that you need to be worried about, right? And anybody that works in a franchise um, system knows exactly what I'm talking about. Independent agents. Anybody, anybody do insurance in here? Yeah, insurance, yeah. So you got an independent agency network, none of them work for you, right? But how do you give them access to critical business systems, right? How do you let them in? You know, basically what happens today is you cobble it together with pieces and parts. Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, uh, maybe you bootleg an AD, you got an AD on the other side of the DMC, all these different kinds of things, right? So when we look at it, you got a tier one, tier two partner, like, how do you change access control for a partner that changes tier levels with you, right? Or a supplier who all of a sudden is now pulling, you know, from a physical logistics standpoint, is pulling all this stuff for you and they become a top tier provider for you. How do you change all their access, right? How do you manage all of these other access control kind of challenges with your identity solutions that are in place today? The answer is you're probably not, right? Now there's one in here that I particularly like because I already referenced it. You know, you got partners in the same portfolio. Lord, if you work for a private equity or VC portfolio company, everybody wants access to your stuff from all the other companies, right? Um, here's one of my other favorite ones. How many of you had external auditors that have shown up and said, we need access today? Yeah, that's a great one. Isn't, it? Isn't that like an immediate violation of excessive privilege and access? Like the auditor goes, I need access today and you go, well, I'm sorry, you need to go through governance. No, 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 I need access today. Like this is the messed up world and all these other identities that we work with. And how many of you have uh, auditors who have unexpectedly had ac access available to them for the next year's audit? Nobody has to admit to that because it didn't get shut off in the year prior, right? But I see some heads, heads nodding, right? So when we think about the onboarding and all this type of different stuff, I mean, one of the things that is clear in this all other identity space on how badly it's being managed is just this reality. Contractor comes back for the seventh time, still has access to all the systems that he had in the prior six visits and shouldn't, right? You guys know that these are real problems and I'm perfectly fine being the person that points out the obvious, right? Because by pointing out the obvious, we're understanding, first of all, that these identities are nonlinear, and we're also understanding that there's tremendous room for risk reduction in this space. If you just went and solved for one population that was riding on an AD on the other side of the DMZ, you reduce tangibly inherent and residual risk within your organizations. But the reality is today that you're not reducing that inherent or residual risk because most people, when they hear about these identities and hear about them articulated in a way that resonates, go like this, la, 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 right? Because we have very, very difficult and complicated jobs already in identity, and now you wanna add more identities to the stack, but the truth is, is these identities are the single largest unmitigated risk in your enterprise, organization, government agencies today. Bar none, no other risk comes closer. I just get to be the first one pointing it out and talking about it. Um, the other thing is, is you don't own all the data for these people, right? If you're a contractor, the agency that represents you technically owns your data, right? You're not a human being, actually, you're manifesting and perfecting a contract. So you don't own all that data. So how do you manage those identities? It's tricky, right? Um, Let's see where we're going. Oh, yeah, <laughs> back up real quick. And you are not the boss of these people, <laughs> right? Um, that's particularly complicated in the FTC space, but also in the partner and supply chain management, both digital and physical. You're not the boss of these people. You have a commercial relationship with, you, with them. And the way that we've mitigated these risks in the past are two ways. 
rely on the contract and cyber insurance. And if you've been paying, the cyber paying attention to cyber insurance, the one thing that you know is, is that cyber insurance is paying out anywhere from zero to 30 cents on the premium uh, stated dollar every time breaches and, and exploits are happening. So cyber insurance ain't taking care of it, right? Really, nothing's taking care of it at all until we make a determination to take action. So how do you manage these identities today? You know, separate AD. I know a lot of companies that do. An AD outside of your boundaries. I mentioned the AD, you know, outside of DMZ. Manually, lots of companies are managing this with spreadsheets and a couple of handful of people. Um, HRIS, I get this all the time. Well, I'll just put it in Workday. Uh, any Californians in here? Yeah, okay, cool. How, how good does it work out when you put contractors into HR systems in California? That's, that's kind of special, right? That runs into legality issues, and all of a sudden you're expected to provide benefits and treat those employees as actual, or those contractors as actual employees, right? So HRIRS is one way, but it has challenges. Um, ignore them. That is the predominant method. I know, I, I mean, I know I gave a lot of spoilers early, but ignoring them is definitely the predominant version. Cross your fingers, lucky rabbit's foot, I don't know, right? Vendor management, that's a classic one. Like anybody that's worked in, a long in identity for a long time, how well does it uh, work out for us to depend, to depend on uh, HR and vendor management? Does that work out great? No. <laughs> like HR data, like I always like to use the example, especially during COVID, HR data is so bad that you get that, hey, um, I need a new laptop. And they go, great, we'll send it to your home address. And you're like, well, I'm staying someplace else, so you can't send it to my home address. Can you think of anything based on data that's supposed to be an authoritative source that has more of an opportunity for man in the middle than HR data? <laughs> like, all I got to do is just change an address, and all of a sudden, you know, stuff's going someplace else, right? So uh, customizations, obviously, uh, customizations and duct tape are probably second to ignoring them, right? And everybody knows the challenge with customizations in this environment. How big is the risk and threat? Here's what I'm trying to promote today and get your attention on, right? And we're going to go a couple minutes past just so we can get everybody in here, um, but not, not much past the top of the hour. I want everybody in this room to recognize that when I start talking about, you know, this brand new acronym of AOID, right, this all other identities. We're talking about what I mentioned earlier, the largest unmitigated, unremediated, unmanaged risk in your organization. We know the big players, Paige Thompson, AWS, right, the Capital One breach, contractor, right, Edward Snowden. Now, I always like to take a minute on the Edward Snowden case because I spent a lot of time doing personal research on it. A lot of people don't know that one of the things that Edward Snowden did as a, as a contractor was he had a position with the federal government and he realized that there was a lower paying contract position that gave him greater access to production databases. And he actively lobbied for a lower paying position with his contracting agency, with Booz, to get access to the data that ultimately became the Snowden breach. If you think social engineering only exists with the bad actors who are out there trying to get you to click a link, this man was a master of social engineering and he was a contractor with none of the controls that you had over your workforce employees, right? When we look at um, Saudi Aramco, Saudi Aramco's gotten nailed multiple times and the vast majority of them have been through contractors, right? We just never know their name because it's Saudi Arabia. So, um, and DNA Solutions is a brand new one that recently came up. Oklahoma uh, City Police Department, the third party service provider actually stole all of the digital evidence. The third party service provider that was supposed to be doing the DNA evaluation and retention stole that information. So it's not just contractors. It's third-party providers, it's vendors. It's, if you know the Home Depot hack, right, you know that that was a third-party payment processor, right? This space of all other identities is such a massive amount of risk and opportunity for us to improve our organizations. We just got to convince everybody in our company that it's actually a problem. So 
I've mentioned it, here it is in big bold print, it's the most exploited unmitigated threat on the planet in every company. So I wanna make sure that there's a call to action. What do you do next, right? It's one thing for me to stay, stand up here and say, I've been, I'm just simply saying what everybody's been thinking for 20 years. Um, it's another to say what you should do about it, right? So get curious. You know, what's really, really cool about the space of all other identities is you can do really, really small proof of concepts to prove how big the problem is. It's literally a sample set exercise. Like, let me go dig into this space where nobody's actually been controlling these identities and see what that looks like. And if you do, like when I was a CISO for a Swiss company, you'll find somebody that was using their access because they were a 16 year employee um, and using that access to create credentials for other people that then led to $164,000 embezzlement from my company, right? Simply because we didn't pay attention to who was controlling all these other identities. Once you start to dig in, you're gonna find some really interesting things. Evaluate and analyze the unmitigated risks associated with those identities. I'm not asking you to like do something massive in your entire organization. I'm asking you to first identify those other identities figure out which ones are the higher, highest risk, and then do something about them, and see what happens, because it's really, really interesting. And then develop a program focused on authoritative source, contextual identity, access and identity assurance, and identity description. Um, if you're gonna take a picture of a slide, I'm gonna ask you to take a picture of this one right here, and this third bullet in particular, because these are terms that we do not use in identity on a regular basis, right? But the identity ascription, the identity assurance, the identity verification and validation is where you need to focus your attention on all these other identities that have been ignored for the last couple of decades. Now with that being said, I am a resource to the market, right? I always tell people, I am not an expert, right? If you know anything about my background, you know that I stood up centralized identity in one of the largest banks on the planet about 13 years ago. And all I did was take the beatings and the bruises long before anybody else did, right? But I get an opportunity to go around, you know, now actually physically around the world again, and learn about everything that's going on in identity in the world. If I can be a resource to you, this is my actual cell phone number. It is not a Google number. It is not anything, you know, kind of as a proxy. And these are my contact points. You are more than welcome to contact me. I hope to be a resource for you at some point. Thank you very much.